All right, so today we're talking about how did the cultural attitudes of the Renaissance have an effect on the politics of the time. So if we're going to be thinking about why the Renaissance is seen as a break from the Middle Ages, depending if you want to believe Burke or Burkhardt, uh, you have to think about how the states are becoming more consolidated, which was something that was a trend that was happening since the Middle Ages. So during this era, we have what are referred to as the new monarchies. And the new monarchies, they offered an institution of monarchy as a guarantee of law and order instead of the chaos of feudalism and the decentralization of the Middle Ages. They proclaimed that hereditary monarchy was legitimate form of public power and all should accept this without resistance. And they enlisted the support of the middle class in the town. So first you have to have a middle class um, developing in the town so that they could support the monarchs. And what that does is kind of bypasses the power of the feudal nobles. They would have to get their monarchy sufficiently organized, their finances into reliable order, meaning they have to have some sort of reliable way of collecting taxes. Because one of the reasons why the feudal nobles had so much power is they can kind of control the money, and the nobles didn't really have, I mean, the kings didn't really have access to that, that money. So they would break down the mass of feudal inherited customary or common law in which the rights of the feudal classes were entrenched. So you need to have some form of social mobility. Um, the kings would make the law enacted by its own authority, regardless of the previous custom or historical liberties, meaning with kind of functioning without having to rely on the nobles. And we start to see this develop in starting in the late 13th century. We're starting to see the royal governments kind of begin to grow um, in the 14th and 15th century. Part of this comes on because of wars so like the Hundred Years War is going to help for the French monarch to consolidate his power. Um, and we start to see bureaucracies develop that are the symbols, the sign. Think about this, talk about this a lot in the AP world at the beginning of the year 9A, how the bureaucracy is kind of the basic step of a more complex organized government, and they start to be paid in cash. Um, and we start to see, again, this all happens because of tax revenue. So where are these new monarchs? Um, in England, it's going to be stabil stability provided for by the Tudors. In France, it's going to be a consolidation of power, typically brought about as a result of the Hundred Years' War. Spain is going to be the unification of Spain, because remember, medieval Spain is a series, is, is ruled by the Muslims, and then a series of separate kingdoms. And then the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically Germany and Central Europe, has a completely different model um, and is completely decentralized. So when we're talking about these new monarchs, we're basically focusing on England, France, and Spain. So let's start with France. So as a result of the Hundred Years' War, France has something called perpetual taxes. We're going to learn when we talk about England, England has something referred to as the, the, the parliament has something called the power of the purse. In France, the king has something called the talé, and what the talé is, is a direct tax. This started in 1439. Um, and so this was the largest and most predictable source of cap crown revenue. And this is going to be one of the major reasons why France is going to be able to consolidate into a strong monarchy. Now, it's going to be the Valois family that is going to be ruling France during this time period. Um, and we're going to start off, go backtrack a little bit. We're going to talk about um, a man by the name of Charles. Of course, if I didn't move this, hold on, let me turn my pen back on. Charles the Eighth. So Charles the Eighth was able to set up a professional army, um, a national administration, and a diplomatic course corps. Now he governed. He ruled from. And now my pen's gonna stop working. He ruled from 1461 to 80. And then prior to him was a man by the name of Louis the 11th, who ruled from 1460. Sorry, hold on, wrong date. Obviously, you see that there's something wrong there. These are the wrong dates for Charles. Sorry. So Charles is going to govern from 1483. To 1498. So let's talk a little bit about Louis the Eleventh first. So Louis the Eleventh was in a feud with the Dukes of Burgundy. Remember, we talked about the Dukes of Burgundy in regards to the Hundred Years' War. They were. Um, you can see everything here in yellow. 
this is all Burgundy, the Duchy of Burgundy. So Burgundy was a multilingual state um, east of France. It's mostly Belgium and the Netherlands. It was the wealthiest principality in Europe. Some of the land was in Fife to France, and the other was in Fife to the Holy Roman Empire. So Burgundy was being governed by a man by the name of Philip the Good. So Philip the Good was the Duke of Burgundy. He left to his son, Charles the Bold. Um, now, Charles the Bold was a little bit too bold, and he was defeated when his ambition grew too great. He basically wanted to create a single state from the Alps all the way to the North Sea. And what Louis is going to do, what Louis XI is going to do, is he's going to support all of his opponents. Um, and then he was able to help to consolidate, further consolidate his own power than France, because as leaders of the very smaller kingdoms of France died without heirs, because you could see here the map of France is a patchwork, um, as people were dying without heirs, he acquired their land. And when he dies in 1483, he pretty much has the borders of France similar to what the borders of France um, are today. He's succeeded, like I said, by Charles VIII, who rules from 1483 to 1498. Now, Charles kind of gets to inherit the, the cornerstone that Louis set up. So he has a professional army. He has a diplomatic corps. He has a natural national administration. A lot of the things that we think of typical of, you know, effective governments. Um, because what also Louis did to kind of set the stage up for Charles is he ended the, he kind of consolidated power of the nobility. He expanded trade. He expanded industry. He expanded the national postal system. So again, Louis is kind of sets the cornerstone of the French nation. And he also helps to get England completely out of France. So this, like I said, puts Charles V, Charles VIII into a very strong position um, when he becomes king. Now, Charles VIII was very, very interested in Italy and consolidating power in Italy. So basically, remember how I said in class that the Italian city-states are constantly fighting with each other. And Charles was able to use this to his advantage. So basically in the despot of Milan, so in Milan you had Ludovico, he was known as Il, Mo Il Moro, he was from the Sforza family. This is one of these major families. Um, he was known as Il Moro because he was supposedly have very dark skin so he was known as the Moor which is a Spanish Muslim. Um, so basically there was a lot of hostility between Milan and Naples and Naples was supported by Florence. So you have on one side, you have Naples, which is in Southern Italy. So Naples was supported by Florence, um, and the Pope who happened to be Alexander the sixth, who was the Pope at the time. So Milan, who hated Naples, and Naples was backed by Florence and the Pope, Milan then, or Sforza, then went and enlisted the help of Charles. So Charles VIII comes in at the bequest of Ludovico El Moro, and basically this gives Charles the in to kind of come in, conquer Florence, conquer the Papal States, and conquer Naples. So this was kind of really bad. This was a bad move. Like Ludovico El Moro kind of really kind of was like, oh, maybe this was something I should not have done. Um, also at this time, Spain saw an opportunity here and they expand their possessions from Sicily. Um, so they kind of like, you know, kind of get it on the bandwagon as well. So now Spain's coming in from the south. You got France coming in from the north. Um, so in 1495, in March, no, my pen is not working. So in March of 1495, you have something called the League 
of Venice is formed. Now, the League of Venice is Venice, obviously. Otherwise, that would just be strange. The Papal States and the Emperor. Now, when I say the Emperor, I'm referring to the Holy Roman Emperor. So, so let's see. It's Venice, the Papal States, and the Emperor against the French. And so this conflict kind of lasts on and off until 1559. All of this, I'll go to the next slide so I can write this, all of this is referred to as the Haps... Sorry. And I just spelled Habsburg wrong. Hold on one second. And why are you so working? So the Habsburgs are the rulers of Spain and Austria, and the Valois are the rulers of France. And this lasts, like I said, up until 1559. The end result of this is basically France um, leaves in the mid-16th century, and it leaves Italy completely defeated and internally divided. It's one of the reasons why Italy is going to have a hard time trying to unite and I want you to kind of keep this in the back of your head also because this is kind of the background in which Machiavelli writes The Prince. So what we now know is France is a consolidated power, got their nobles in line, got taxes, and are kind of moving on and trying to become expansionist. So now let's look at England. So England really at this point is kind of like the Hicks of Europe. They're off on their own separate islands, rarely threatened by foreigners, kind of not really a part of a lot of European politics, and everyone else kind of makes fun of England, like, oh, whatever, England. Um, they never develop perpetual taxes like the Talle, like the French have. So Parliament always maintains what they call the power of the purse strings. Anytime the king wants to enact a new tax, they have to get approval from Parliament. And that's a really important thing to note. You might even want to underline that in your notes, because that's something that's going to be very important moving forward and talking about English history and why England winds developing into a constitutional monarchy further down the road. So the mean, so basically England at this point is pretty minor in international politics, but the thing that's going to create stability in England is something referred to as the War of the Roses. And it's two prominent families in England. One of the Lancastrians, which are represented by the Red Rose, and the others are the Yorkists, which are represented by the White Rose. So I'm about to throw out a lot of names at you, but I'll try to make this as, as clear as possible. So, Henry VI and his wife, Margaret of Anjou. Anjou is a region in France. They are Lancastrian. So Henry, though, was, was pretty much incompetent. And there was a regent that ruled for him. That regent, who was Richard, the Duke of York, is eventually going to try to claim the throne. This is very much going to upset the queen. Uh, oy, sorry. This is going to upset the queen, Margaret of Anjou. Um, she is going to raise an army. She is going to lead it. And she is going to wind up killing or having Richard killed. So, as a result... Richard's son, you can see some of the battles. Richard's son, Edward, the Duke of York, comes into London and proclaims himself Edward IV of England. So he takes power. He winds up reforming the administration, encouraging the growth of trade, and he was able to raise funds and to be able to rule separate from Parliament. The problem was he didn't last very long as king. He dies in 1483, and he has two young sons as his heirs. His brother, Richard, is going to be the regent. Okay, so this is still all the York. What happens in this instance is still a mystery. Basically, Richard, who is the nep the the uncle of the two little nephews of his, you know, his brother's sons, who he's supposed to be regent for. They disappear mysteriously. No one knows what happens to them. The princes are never seen again. 
he declares himself Richard III of England. You can imagine this didn't work out well for Richard because everyone kind of saw him as a villain. He was seen as doing something nefarious to his nephews. The bodies of the nephews were never found. No one knows what happened to them. As a result, um, basically support is going to grow for the Lancastrian family. This is kind of the end that the Lancastrians needed. So as a result, there's going to be a battle. It's called the Battle of Bosworth Field in which Richard III is going to be defeated. He is going to be defeated by this man who is going to become Henry VII of England. Now, Henry VII, he was um, of partial Welsh descent, which is one of the reasons why the heir to the English throne today is the Duke or the Prince or Princess of Wales. Um, he had some illegitimacy on his line, which is why he's not Edward uh, Henry of Lancaster. He's Henry Tudor. Um, but he manages to defeat Edward, and he makes himself Henry VII. He is going to rule England from 1485 to 1509. He is going to be a diplomat. So after coming to power using war, he is going to avoid war after that point. He ended the rivalries, and to kind of cement that, he marries Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth of York, and that's also why the Tudor Rose, if you'll notice, is both red and white, because he joined together the Tudors and the Lancastrians. And so basically, he encouraged the development of trade. Like I said, he was partially Welsh, which kind of helped lay the groundwork for the union of Wales with England. He dealt with belligerent nobles rather than by going after them. He basically levied really, really heavy fines against them. So he would basically bankrupt them, which would destroy their military capabilities. One of the most important things he did was the creation of something called the Star Chamber. And the reason why it was called the Star Chamber, if this would let me write, now the reason why this was called the Star Chamber, and he starts this in 1487, is the room that they met in was a big room with a blue ceiling and it had stars in it. <coughs> And so what he did is it set up a council for the king who were not judges, who were not necessarily nobles. And so he ended the nobles' ability to use intimidation and to use bribery to kind of um, gain position. So he basically had a set of um, councils who were judges and were not swayed by bribes. Um, and he could kind of influence them. And so he basically kind of controlled the judicial system. Also during this time, because of the two little princes that no one knows what happens to them, there were a lot of pretenders to the throne. Um, men stepping up and saying that they really were one of those two princes. And so as a result, he went after those people. So there was lots of fines and confiscation of land and executions of people who supported these pretenders to the throne. And what that did is it added to his royal lands. Um, and when he dies in 1509... He has a very strong authority over England, and he's also dependent upon his lands, the revenue he gets from his lands, and not taxes, so he doesn't have to worry about Parliament. He leaves his son, Henry VIII, in a really good place to rule. Henry proceeds to you know, blow through all of the cash, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but there you can see Henry VII marries Elizabeth of York. They're going to have a son, Arthur, a son, Henry, a daughter, Margaret, and a daughter, Mary. And this is going to be the basis of the Tudor line, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and there you can see that's the land that they controlled in 1485. So now moving out of England, we're going to move on to Spain. So Spain um, had a difficult terrain. They didn't get a lot of average rainfall, fall, and they had very little surplus wealth. So they really weren't in that good of a position. Um, there was a lot of ethnic, political, and religious differences in Spain. Um, when we think of Ferdinand and Isabella, Ferdinand was of the region of Aragon, and Isabella was the ruler of a region called Castile, um, and their marriage in 1469 is going to be kind of seen as what brings Spain together, but they really basically ruled independently, and it's their heirs that, that, that inherited a united Spain. However, Castile and Aragon had separate laws, separate armies, separate money, 
separate taxes, and separate culture. Castile, the area that Isabella was from, was much richer, had a bigger population, and it was really um, well-funded because of the sheep uh, farming industry. And here you can see kind of a map. Uh, this was the Iberian Peninsula in 1280. You could see all the different kingdoms that were there. And then eventually it was just Aragon and Castile. So you can see Castile is considerably larger um, than Aragon. So basically Castile was a much more centralized state um, in something called the Cortes of Toledo. This was established in 1480. I don't know why my pen's not letting me write, but that was in 1480. Um, royal officials who were appointed to positions in the government had to reside in the city to protect the interest of the crown and to supervise elections. So the crown's authority over the church, the crown had a great deal of authority over um, their nobles in Castile. Aragon was a little bit different. Aragon wasn't nearly as big um, and did not really have as much of a consolidated power. But basically, in 1482, together, the two kingdoms subdued the realms, secured the borders, and began to Christianize Spain. So by 1512, they won the allegiance of a group called the Hermanidad. which was the League of Cities and Towns. And they got their support against the landowners. The townspeople allied with the crown, and they replaced the nobility and royal administration, which gave them more power. Remember, you need the support of the middle class, not the support of the nobles, if we're going to move into these more modern monarchies. So Spain, for most of its history, you had the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, all living together with tolerance. Isabella and Ferdinand, are going to use religion to create control and create national unity. Just like when we think about in world history, we learned about just like how they used, because it's the same group, it's the same people, basically. Just like when in the colonies in the New World, they used religion as a means to control the people and unite the Native Americans, it's going to be the same thing here. So the toleration that Spain had experienced for most of the Middle Ages is going to end. Um, in 1479, the Inquisition is going to be brought to Spain. The Inquisition is a board of inquisitors who question people to monitor the people and make sure those people who were converted, who Jew, make sure that the Jews and Muslims who had converted to Christianity were actually, in fact, Christian. So in 1492, Jews were exiled. Their property was confiscated. And in 1502, the Muslims were drawn into exile. Um, so basically they kind of use religion and religious unity as their means of control. The other thing that they were really good at was marriage. Um, and they used marriage as a way to kind of build their empire. So this is where we're going to see the Spanish Habsburgs become this major branch. They're also going to be um, part of the Austria. There's going to be a time when the, the rulers of Spain and the rulers of Austria are all going to be the same people. And one of the reasons why that happened is Joanna, who was known as Joanna the Mad, who was daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, she is going to be married to the Archduke Philip the Fair. He was the son of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. So he's controlling um, the Netherlands. He's controlling what today is Germany, Austria, most of Central Europe. These two people are going to get married in 1496. Their son... Charles, who is Charles I of Spain and Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. He is the son of Joanna and Philip. He is going to become the first ruler of a united Spain, and he's going to be elected Holy Roman Emperor in 1519. So he's going to be controlling a vast amount of lands all throughout Europe. So everything here that's in purple is the lands that he directly controls. And then everything that's within those red borders, those are the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire, which he's also going to have power over because he becomes, he's elected Holy Roman Emperor. I'll talk about how that works in a second. Um, Catherine of Aragon 
um, who is Charles the First's, no, who's Char, who Joan, who is Joanna and Archduke Philip's daughter, is going to eventually marry Henry VIII of England. We'll talk about that later too. Also during this time period, we see for the Spanish a promotion of exploration because Columbus is sailing the ocean blue, the creation of a Spanish empire. Spain is also getting Sicily and Naples from England, uh, from Italy, and they basically are going to become one of the dominant powers in Europe. And so Charles V is going to unite all of these lands in 1522. Now, one thing just to speak on very briefly about all this land that he controls, just because he controls all this land, each of these areas have a different way in which they are controlled by Charles. So just because he's king of Spain doesn't mean that he has the same type of power over Naples versus the same type of power over the Netherlands. He has to work out different negotiations and different settlements with each of the various different nobles uh, that control those areas. So it actually is a rather convoluted area um, that he controls. So next, let's move on to the Holy Roman Empire. So the Holy Roman Empire, Voltaire said it wasn't holy, wasn't Roman, wasn't an empire. Now it's basically a patchwork quilt of what is today Central Europe. It was, it's a series of separate kingdoms and autonomous regions numbering close to 300. And they're all autonomous. They all have self-rule. Um, in 1356, there was something created called the Golden Bull. And what the Golden Bull did is it regularized imperial elections. Because like I said before, Charles V was elected Holy Roman Emperor. So this was something, you were an elected official if you were Holy Roman Emperor. It was a position you held for life, though. There were seven permanent electors. So within this patchwork quilt, some of the, the seven largest regions were considered electors. And they were they made up an administrative body that elected the, the emperors and provided what very little unity there was. However, there was no incentive to increase the power of the emperor. So with every election, the emperor and the electors renegotiated the type of power he had. So essentially you have a completely unstable grouping of people together. Um, they were constantly fighting with each other. They did at times try to create certain bodies to bring themselves together, like the Reichstag. Um, but basically, they constantly just fought with each other. Also, between 1524 to 1525, we're going to have the Peasants' Rebellion in what becomes known as the Great Peasant War. This area is perfect for there to be a Protestant Reformation because a lot of these various different princes and rulers are going to use religion as a way to combat the power of the Emperor and Charles V's attempt to consolidate his power in this region. So we're going to be talking a lot about the Holy Roman Empire when we talk about... Um, when we talk about the, the Protestant Reformation. And we'll also talk a little bit about the, them trying to challenge the growth of the, whole, of the Ottoman Empire, but we'll talk about that later. So the last place we're going to talk about really briefly, I promise, is Russia. So Russia, of course, was ruled by the nobles, uh, assuming that the nobles died, was ruled by the Mongols. Um, for most, you know, most of the 1400s, they were considered the Khanate of the Golden Horde, starting in the 1300s. Um, Ivan III, which is this man here, he manages to stand up to the Mongols. In 1480, he refuses to pay tribute to the Mongols, and he declares himself the Tsar of all of Russia. And the Tsar is the Russian word for Caesar. He annexed most of the independent Russian principalities and city-states and kind of brought them into his own area. Um, his army was paid with land, and this created an armed class of landowners um, who owed their prosperity to the Tsar. He also, when he gave people who were loyal to him land, he resettled them. So he broke up local alliances in order to kind of create this group of people that were loyal to the Tsar. In 1497, he issued an edict restricting peasant movement, which is the exact opposite of what we're seeing in Western Europe. Now, the Tsar of Russia is an autocrat. There are no representative institutions. It is an Orthodox Christian country, completely hostile to the Latin church and very much influenced by the Turks, the Persians, and the Byzantines. So you're having a whole different slew of cultural influences coming into Russia. Um, one of the most important leaders of this time, and we'll talk about him in later detail later, is a man by the name of Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible. And what he does is he goes after the boyars, B-O-Y-A-R, the boyars who are the nobles, um, and he manages to 
take power away from the nobles and create autocracy based on state terror, which is kind of like what the Russians really kind of like to do. So I want you just to see this is pretty much Eastern Europe in 1550. So we see Western Europe, France, England, Spain, cities, you know, nation states like we see today. Holy Roman Empire is a complete mess. And then you have a growing Russian Empire, a growing Ottoman Empire, and then certain states like Poland, Prussia, you know, Lithuania, which are going to kind of come and go um, as they get kind of swallowed up by the larger powers. So, why are these countries beginning to become nation-states is the question I want you to think about, and I'll see you guys in class.